Hey everybody, Marty the OT Guy here. Welcome back. If you're one of our long-term viewers, thank you very much for coming back again. And if you're somebody new who's just joined in, thank you for stepping in. I hope you find this interesting and uh, I encourage you to go back and look at some of our older videos. You might find something good in there too. So in this episode, we're going to take a look at a whole bunch of different things. We're going to spend some time talking about the Nozomi Network's 2023 first half security report. We'll look at some highlights and, and show you where you can get that from. Um, we're going to do some lab demos and, and share with you some queries and some ideas that you might find useful in your environment. We are going to... Uh, we're going to round it all out with an overview of some of the features in Nozomi Network's uh, into OS version 23.2, which came out um, within the last few days. And then because we haven't done one for a while, let's have a bit of a war story. So yeah, stick around. I hope you find it enjoyable. And um, yeah, let's, let's have some fun. All right, let's go. Okay, so... I'd like to share some of the content and information that we've provided in the Nozomi Network's work, um, first half 2023 OT and IoT security report. Uh, there's some really cool content in here. There's just too much to cover. Um, so I'm just going to grab some highlights and let's take a look at what's in there. So the first thing you need to do is actually get a copy of the report. So jump to our website, look under resources, and then under reports. And at the time we filmed this, you'll find that the uh, both the full report and the executive summary are available right at the top of the page. Um, grab a copy, download, take a look. Um, I think you'll be pleasantly pleased, pleasantly surprised um, with what's in there. There's some really useful information. And as I just said before, we're not going to cover everything. There's just too much of it. But let's take a look at um, a few notable points. So I'm going to start here with the timeline of notable events for the first six months of 2023. And the first thing that stuck out to me was that barely a month has gone by without something happening. Um, and, you know, if you've been in the OT security industry for a while, um, you you too are probably noticing that the pace is changing, right? Uh, the need to ensure we can protect our environments is, it's not going away. Uh, and the only way around it is constant and continuous improvement. That's what will make your, uh, that's what will, that's what will lead you to win this game. Next up, look at some legislation changes. The year kicked off with some sizable changes in legislation. And I think for me anyway, what I'm noticing is that the NIST 2 directive in Europe um, is triggering a lot of discussion in the markets. Um, and that's not to downplay the US or Australian changes, but um, I think that's one of the bigger ones that's going to hit this year. So healthcare has gathered some really interesting statistics in the first six months of 2023. And, and I guess you could say that a lot of people have been waiting for healthcare to sort of step into the limelight um, in the cybersecurity space, and maybe this is it. But nearly 1,500 attacks per week, that is staggering. Let's take a little look at the CVEs released by sector. Um, and, and that first column, the multiple sectors, probably should always be the highest. But uh, for me, seeing critical manufacturing as, as the number two, or you know, if you disregard multiple sectors, seeing critical manufacturing as the highest sector, se um, it shouldn't be much of a such of us, I suppose, due to the size of the industry globally. But um, you know, again, over you know, over past years, we're used to seeing energy and water, wastewater, um, even transportation, perhaps being up in these higher levels. But um, to have them um, to pass by manufacturing, I think that's really interesting. So let's look at intrusion alerts, network scanning, and clear text passwords. No surprises there. These are the most of the common things I see when I'm um, in calls with customers and, and trying to help them understand their environments. These are still the most, uh, the things that we see the most. Now, perhaps, I don't know, I don't know this is fair to say, I might be wrong, but perhaps it's fair to say that network scans should be fairly easy to solve in your environment. Um, but I know in some OT environments, Getting rid of devices with clear text passwords, that can be a challenge. So this, this could be something that sticks around for a while. Industry insights, um, network scans and water treatment. That's that's an eye-opener in some respects. Um, uh, is Perhaps is this indicative of a need to change behaviours within that environment? The top credentials. Um, I was a little surprised not to see admin admin as the number one in here. Um, 
But in all truth, except for the top two, none of these are really surprising. Um, but I'll also bet there's a good story around why these top two in, uh, entries sit there at, at numbers one and two. If anyone knows the story, let me know. Okay, so that's enough looking at the insights within our security report. I really, really encourage you, grab a copy either of the full report or grab the executive summary, but better yet, grab both. Take a look. There's heaps of information in there. There's a huge amount of information um, that you can use to help you make informed decisions in your business and, and move yourselves forward, improving your security posture. So Microsoft have announced that uh, very soon they will be disabling TLS 1.0 and 1.1 in Windows. Uh, and you can see here, we've, we've the announcement from Microsoft um, dated August 10th. So yep, yeah, it's, it's going to happen soon. Um, and you may be asking, you may be question, well, what's an easy way to find out which devices in my network are, um, are running this version of TLS and, and then you can plan to do something about it. So let's take a look at how we do that. Um, using a query in the Guardian. So here we are in the Guardian, and uh, I'm on the queries page, as you can see, and I've started entering a query here. So the first thing we're going to do is query the alerts table, because that's where the information will be about these TLS, about devices using TLS 1.0, 1.1. Um, and we're going to refine the query by asking for alerts with a description which include TLS. So if we run that now, we get all sorts of sorts come back. So let's refine it a little bit more and improve what we see. So let's look at our source IP addresses and include only those ones that are inside the network space, uh, inside my network space, because I can't control what someone externally um, may use or choose to use. So you may only look at this look at your OT space um, yeah, it, it, this helps to helps to refine things, right? So we've got, uh, you know, we, we we're tightening up our include our our re result set now. You can see you can IP source column. We've just got IP addresses that exist within my my space here. But let's go even further. Let's let's tidy it up a bit more and let's pick the source IP. Helps if I spell it right. Source IP the source zone where the device is located because this could be easy this might help you in your environment right um, and let's select the risk so that we understand which of these we should solve first we're going to add the unique um, keyword in here so that we because we don't need multiple results from the same IP address we only need to know which one and then we're going to sort by risk in descending order. Let's see what we get. Look at that. Very, very simple. A nice, easy report. So it's showing there, what's that, about 11 or 12 devices um, that exist within my space here um, and showing them by order of risk. So it's telling me that, uh, that my PC is the first thing I should look at um, and, and work in why it's using TLS 1.0 and 1.1. And it really is that simple. So we'll share, or we've shared that um, that query will be appearing on screen. screen. Um, yeah, hope you find it useful. So I've had some people reach out and ask some questions about how to do some querying with our th or around our threat intelligence, how to identify which CVEs are covered, maybe how to work out which devices have different vulnerabilities associated with them and report on that a little better. And what I've done is come up with three scenarios that you might find helpful, um, to understand vulnerabilities and threat intelligence in your environment. Let's take a look. Okay, scenario number one. You need to find out if a given CVE is covered within your Nozomi Network's threat intelligence subscription. So we'll start off here with this example CVE that I've pulled up this web page here. Um, so this CVE applies to a PLC that I have in my lab. So the first thing I want to do is grab the CVE, um, the number, right? CVE 2022-46670. So I'm going to copy that, then jump back over to my Nozomi device, and you can see here I've pre-populated this query. So let's, let's look at what the query does. So it's starting with the CVE files table, and it's looking for CVEs which include that CVE name. So let's run it. And it's coming back and showing me that there is a, there is a valid uh, result, which is a good thing because it means that this CVE is covered within our threat intelligence. 
and you can see here it's enabled and it's valid so it's there but what does this actually mean how does this help you so the information from the CVE is used to calculate CPE to calculate what vulnerabilities are on your assets through the CPE enumeration so if I change across to my assets here and I've got the Micrologics PLC selected that has this particular vulnerability. Now if we jump inside here, you can see that we've got plenty of vulnerabilities. We can search by the, uh, the number here. And all of this information that we're showing now, so the, um, the score, the source, the name, the, the CWE, the matching weakness, the CPEs, the product enumerations that this vulnerability applies to. All of this comes from within the threat intelligence package. And it's not a lot different to the information you'll find on the NVD database uh, through MITRE or wherever. It's not a lot different to that, but it's here within the Guardian. So you don't need to go looking somewhere else, right? And then finally, at the very bottom, you've got a hyperlink there to the vendor's site where they're giving recommendations on how to solve this problem, what you can do about it. So, um... Yeah, this is an easy way to trace from a given CVE to find out, is it covered within your threat intelligence? Um, and if it comes up, if a, an appliance comes up, or sorry, an asset comes up saying it's exposed to that, this is the information that you get from it. Okay, in this scenario, we want to know if indicators of compromise, or IOCs, exist for a known CVE or a threat. So you can see what I'm doing here, we're sort of going to work this from a slightly different angle, but I'm starting with some, um, some alerts here that have been triggered in my lab. So if we look at what the alert description is, in here we've got a CVE number. CVE 2020-1472. I'm going to copy that. Now I need to check inside the threat intelligence uh, package to see whether we've got some IOCs in there that relate to this. So I go to my administration, my settings page, and I go to Threat Intelligence. And you can just step through each of the Threat Intelligence types, the Packet Rules, Yara, Sigma, Sticks. You can step through those, and in the name in the search box, just paste in the CV you're looking for. So you can see here, we have a Packet Rule for Zero Logon. And if I click the little magnifying glass, we get the contents of the Packet Rule. You're going to find some of these packet rules, if they're um, proprietary to Nozomi Networks, you might not be able to look inside them, or some of these um, IOCs and things, you might not be able to look inside them, don't worry about that. Um, in this case, it's reasonably straightforward, it's, um, it's our packet rule language, and all the details are there to look at. So what else do we have? Do we have any Yara rules? Okay, so we're searching here under Yara rules, there are no Yara rules that relate to this vulnerability. There should be a sigma rule, though, because that's the alert that triggered. So we can take a look at that, too. We look inside the rule. We see a title. We see an ID, a description, who made it, um, uh, sorry, references to ex external locations with more information about it. Um, you can see how the detection is done. So we can see in here there's two Windows event log IDs um, and some keywords. And the condition at the very bottom is saying, hey, we want to find these event logs and the keyword, and then we'll call this an actual triggered alert. So this is how you can confirm that the coverage of a given CVE, that we have IOC coverage, and you can know what's going to happen if that trips, if that alert triggers. Now, in this case where the alert has triggered, I can take this information now, go to the endpoint that triggered the alert, and I know what to look for, um, to determine if this is a true positive or, um, or if I'm chasing ghosts. Okay, in this scenario, what I want is to find out if, um, if certain assets are vulnerable to a given CVE or a, um, a, uh, a vulnerability of some sort. So we're going to start off here on the NVD database. And what I've picked here, this CVE that I've picked, I do have devices which are vulnerable to it. We were looking at them in scenario one, right? So we're going to take that and just change our query a little bit. So back on the Guardian here, you can see now we're using the node CVEs table. So these are the actual vulnerabilities that apply to a given node in your environment. And let's look into this, this query. So we've got where CVE summary include micrologics. So I'm, I want the CVEs that relate to a micrologics device. We're going to select the node ID, we're going to select the CVE um, number, the CVE score, the summary, 
we're using the unique keyword to deduplicate, and then we're going to sort by CVE score from highest to lowest. So let's run that. You can see here that what we've got is a whole bunch of um, a whole bunch of results have been returned. So I've got a whole lot of vulnerabilities that are on this device, and you know there's there's eight pages of it there. There's lots there, but we can start with these ones with a CVE score of 10, and we can work down from there. So how do you take this further? You know, maybe this is this is, could be quite cool in some senses, but what if we took it a little further? What if instead of Micrologics, I just wanted to know about my somatic devices? I don't even need to know a CVE number here. All, all you need is maybe a vendor name or a product name, and you can start looking from there. So now I'm looking at my S7 PLC in my lab, and it's coming up with these vulnerabilities. And you can also see by the uh, IP address that one of my engineering workstations has a bit, um, has some vulnerabilities as well. What if we change that to Cisco? So we change it to Cisco, and again, I've got pages and pages of problems here, um, which is, you know, this, this is great information. Well, how can I take this information and turn it into something that's useful um, to leadership or to a board of directors, perhaps? So I built a report that can help with that. So I jump through to reports, and I'm going to look at the generated ones here. I'm going to download this PDF. <clears throat> and you can see on this report, I've, I've done a risk report by vendor, Cisco. So it's, it only contains three widgets. So it's three saved queries, really simple. And they're all variations on the query I just showed you. So we got total average risk for Cisco devices as at today, 7.04. Cool. Cisco device risk average over the last 30 days, 7.5. Okay, Cisco device risk averaged over the last 31 to 90 days, 7.7. .7. This actually paints a really good picture if you're selling this to leadership or sharing this with leadership. Over the last three months, we've moved from 7.7 .7 down to 7.04. So we've had quite an improvement in our risk position um, through the work, through the efforts that we've done over that, over that period of time. This could be a handy report, right? So how does this report work? Let's take a look at the um, take a look at one of the queries from underneath it. So I go back to my queries page. Now I've saved these because um, you need to have saved queries to make reports work, right? That's how we do it, and they're saved in my risk reporting group. Um, so let's take a look at the thirty to ninety days, and I click see in the editor. Right. So we've we've kind of almost got the same query that we started with, right? But we've we've uh, moved it around a little bit. So we're starting with the node CVEs table. We're saying where the CVE summary includes our vendor name, Cisco. We're saying whether days, uh, days ago is less than or equal to 90, um, and then where days ago is greater than 30. So somewhere between a month and three months, right? We want to reduce the CVE score to an average, and then the final command there is show me on a gauge of 0 to 10. So if I run that, we get the same result that we had previously. Now, what if I change it like we did before and I say, I don't want to see Cisco. I want to look for Micrologics. Now I see my Micrologics, 6.43. What if I put the word Windows in there? Goes away and thinks, 7.36. So we could save each of these queries for a different vendor type within our environment and build out reports that we could automate or we could run as we needed to, scheduled or, or um, ad hoc and build out these reports and show the change in risk we're making over a period of time. Okay, into OS version 23.2 dropped recently, and if you're a customer and you haven't checked it out yet, you probably should. Um, grab a copy of the release notes and have a good look, because the items that I'm going to cover here are only a few of the really cool reelings that we've added recently. Um, so let's let's start off and take a look at some of these ideas. Um, alert deduplication. Uh, this is kind of cool because if you've used the product for a while, you know that there's times where you can get a bit of alert fatigue, where um, a, an event may be occurring in your environment that happens more than once, and every time it pops up, you're getting a separate alert to deal with. And we've made some changes now where you can enable this feature and um, deduplicate the alerts. So basically you get one alert for each event when it happens, um, rather than one alert for each occurrence of the same event or the same incident. 
So by default in 23.2, this feature is disabled and you enable it using a manual command within the command line interface. And, and uh, you can find that information on page 379 of the um, user manual for this version. In the future, in future releases, this will be enabled by default. Next thing on the list, Arc, Arc version 1.2. So we've released a new upgrade for Arc. One of the biggest um, improvements we've made now is adding flexible notification periods uh, for larger installations. So that if you've got 100, 150, 200 Arc sensors deployed out there, the notification period will vary um, and automatically adjust itself to, uh, to handle the, the traffic that you've got going on in your environment. That's kind of cool. We are changing the way that we release our software. Uh, so in the past, you used to have a base install file and an advanced install file. And depending on what licensing you had, um, identified which one of those you needed to use. Coming shortly, moving forward, it will be a single install file. You'll no longer have to uh, remember which one you need. Just grab the one install file and go from there. We have improved our import and export functionality around CSV files. They've actually done some really cool things. Um, we shouldn't call it CSV anymore because we don't have to use a comma as the separator. We can separate on semicolons, tabs, tabs. There's a lot of different things we can do. Um, and it's really cool. Um, really worth taking a look at. There's, there's even the ability to import data from a lot of other products now. Uh, with this flexibility to get it straight into the Guardian, which is rather cool. For users of ABB's 800XA systems, we have improved our support of uh, for protocols around that. Did you know that ABB hold the uh, global share, hold the largest share in the global DCS market? I didn't know that. I thought that was interesting info. Um, so anyway, we've improved our asset identification and traffic inspection around our ABB 800XA protocol. I think that's really cool. We have improved some trace replay abilities. So now you can have a variable speed replay. So you can load in a packet trace and change the replay speed. So you can make it dribble along at one megabit or you can just let it go as fast as it wants to. It's actually really cool when you're um, visualizing network behavior live. You can slow things right down. Let's say you have a, I don't know, a 10 megabit network, right? a 100 megabit network. Um, and you want to see things happening a lot slower to inspect what's going on, just slow it down. Capture the packet trace, slow it down. Play it back at one meg. Watch everything appear slowly on the graph in front of you. It's actually pretty cool. And the last thing we're going to have a talk to, we'll just flip across here and do a last demo for you on a cool feature from our previous release. Okay, this final part I'd like to mention is it doesn't actually relate to N2OS version 23.2. This is actually about a feature that we added in 23.1, but it's I think it's really important and really useful. So let's take a let's Okay, so I'm on the Guardian query page again, and the query that I've run this time queries the node CVEs table, looking in the CVE column for the keyword EOL. Uh, was that important? So the change we made in 23.1 is to sort of amalgamate a whole bunch of vulnerabilities into this one entry, CVE EOL. And the purpose of that is in, if you've got a workstation that's running uh, Microsoft or Windows XP and you know it's bad, right? You don't need a big list of vulnerabilities to tell you it's bad. You know it's bad. So why not just have a single entry that you can search upon? Um, it makes reporting and tracking these things easier in your environment. So what we've done here, we've done this query and said, hey, for anything that's showing this CVE EOL, um, give me the node ID and whether it's been resolved or not. Um, and we'll use it as a report here to uh, identify which assets within my environment need some more work done on them. Okay, so war story. So this um, was a project I was involved in around near 2010-ish, I think. Uh, and it happened in a chemical factory uh, on a machine that was designed to um, dispense acid into containers. So you might have a 20 litre container up to a 1,000 litre container and, and all sorts of acids. So it could be nitric, it could be hydrochloric, it could be sulfuric at varying, um, varying strengths. So... 
we're there, we've done some modifications to how the, pro, uh, the process operated, and 99% of the time, everything worked fine. But then you'd get these occasions where something would happen. It was almost as if the, the PLC processor just had a brain fart, um, and it would overfill the container. So you've got this dispensing hose that comes down and there's a valve in it and, and the hose goes into the container you're filling, the valve opens and, and it's supposed to run for, um, it was tracking weight. So the container is sitting on a set of load cells and as the weight increased, the, or rather as the container filled, the weight increased and when you got to the magic weight, you close the valve. Really simple. The problem was sometimes the valve wasn't closing. Um, now, if it was water or orange juice, apple juice, barbecue sauce, it probably wouldn't matter so much. Um, if you have a 20 litre container and the valve's a bit sluggish to close with water or something like that, you get an overflow um, or a bit of spillage. It's not ideal, it's wastage and, and you do need to fix it, but um, it gets a little bit more serious when it's um, highly concentrated acid. And we did have situations where um, on some of the 200 litre drums and even the 1000 litre containers where it did fill and it overfilled by 100 litres sort of thing. It, it was huge and it would just spray. It would just absolutely, you just have constant like 90% sulfuric just hosing out the top of this thing, hitting the roof, hitting the walls and people running for their lives, just running for cover. It was crazy. And immediately, as is always the case, um, the software engineer gets the blame. You know, you've programmed it wrong. It never used to do this. You've programmed it wrong. Find your problem and fix it. Hurry up and do it. You're costing us money and time. And, it, you know, maybe that's fair enough. We had just done an upgrade. Um, and I spent, man, I spent some hours on this. I, I can't remember exactly how long now, but I do know that in the end, um, I was getting frustrated to the point where I was back at the workshop using the same model of processor simulating the operation on my desk and I just couldn't get it to fault, couldn't get to, nothing going wrong, everything was fine um, and I just had the thought, well why don't I just swap the processor out? So we went down with the one from my desk and swapped it out with the one on site and just left it. it the one that was on my desk was a brand new processor for another project so it, um, it, was, it was fine and we just left it. And, and let it run for a week or 10 days and nothing went wrong. Uh, we went from having a problem, you know, maybe once every two days to going two weeks with no problem whatsoever. Um, and nature of the beast is, is people came along, oh, you changed the software, something's different, you're not admitting. Yeah, well, no, I didn't actually. And through the course of this, what, we, what I noticed was occasionally the cycle time um, so if you're not familiar with how PLCs operate or, or how this part of a PLC operates, as it sequentially executes the code, the program code, um, the time taken from start to finish is called the cycle time. And there's, there's um, input and output updates and a few other things and communications overheads and things that you have to look after. And that whole cycle time should remain reasonably static. Um, by, by the way, the, the systems are designed as a real-time operating system. It's intended to remain static. It's supposed to, be, supposed to be something you can bank on. Well, this was varying. Um, and it wasn't unusual to maybe see um, a, a cycle time vary by a millisecond here or there, depending on what was happening within the process. That, that wasn't unusual, but we were talking a lot of milliseconds. Um, and in some cases, it would actually trip the watchdog timer and, and cause the PLC to fault out. So we sort of couldn't work it out. Why is this changing? Why is, why is the cycle time varying so much? And in the end, the customer got to the point where they said, look, this new processor you've put in is working. Can we just leave it here? So we sold them a new one. Um, and I've got this dud processor. And we, we couldn't fault it, no matter how many times we tested it, what we did, just it wouldn't misbehave, but we also couldn't put it under the same load that it was experiencing on site. So we sent it back to the manufacturer and um, it went away for a root cause analysis and after some time, the results came back that the RAM um, was intermittent, intermittently failing. So there were intermittent problems with the 
RAM in the processor, which caused the cycle times to extend. And sometimes you were lucky and the cycle time extended, but not far enough to trip the watchdog. And sometimes you weren't lucky where it, um, where it would trip the watchdog. So it was a bit of a weird one. It was, it was really quite strange. But it was an introduction to why you should, um, you should track and trend your cycle times in a PLC. And if I'm not mistaken, um, and I was meant to look this up before I recorded this, but I plum forgot, so maybe I'll put some graphics up here that, that talks about this. But um, if I'm not mistaken, within the top 20 PLC secure coding practices um, that have been released over the last couple of years, I'm fairly sure that one of the points in there is about monitoring and trending cycle time. Not necessarily for this reason, but this is one of the... Um, this is one of the benefits you can pick up. If you're trending your cycle time and you see some change, it could be indicative of either a problem coming up in your process somewhere um, or a problem in your processor itself. Something has changed. Um, so yeah, that was, that was an interesting, interesting education. Um, and along the way, uh, quite a bit of very strong acid was, um, was spread on some walls and floors and things. And, and thankfully, no one was hurt along the way. Um, but it was a good lesson, all the same. So wow, how about all that then? Hopefully that was useful. Um, there's some really cool information in the security report. I hope you put that to good use in your business. Um, I hope those lab demos were helpful. I hope there's something in there that I've taught you or showed you. Um, if you're not a customer of Dizomi Networks, maybe something I've showed you there will you know, inspire you to pick up and have a chat with us. Um, as always, if you've got any questions, please leave a comment or get in touch. And um, no matter where you are in the world, there's always somebody close by who can help you out with what you want to know. Right, until the next one, my name's Marty the OT Guy. Thanks for dropping in. Like, subscribe, share with your friends, all those good things. Um, help us get the, uh, get the word out there. And um, yeah, let's see you on the next one. Bye.